The title of my message this morning is The Spirit Behind Thanksgiving. The Spirit Behind Thanksgiving. I hope that you picked up a fill-in sheet when you came in that you can take these thoughts home with you today. We want to give the Lord genuine thanksgiving. And the first point in your notes is realize the process to genuine thanksgiving. Now, I wonder when God looks down and sees us and he hears us worship and he hears us talk, whether he would look and say, you know what, that's genuine thanksgiving. Or are we sort of like the children of Israel where we speak it with our words, we sing it in our songs, but I wonder if our hearts are really engaged. It says in Isaiah that the Lord said, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from it. We don't want that to be so for us. We want to have a genuine thanksgiving. And we need to realize the process that brings us to genuine thanksgiving. So when I looked at this, I just looked at the word thanksgiving and looked it up in the dictionary, and I have it in your notes there. Thanksgiving is to give or express gratitude. It's not just a feeling, it's not just a, a thought, but you are actually giving it or expressing it in some way, either verbally, with your hands, however, with your physical body, you are expressing gratitude. Well, if we want to get deeper, what is gratitude? Well, I just looked it up in the dictionary as well, and it says, a feeling of appreciation for good things. A feeling of appreciation. So it comes back to this feeling that I have, and it's appreciation for good things. Well, what does it mean to appreciate something? So I just looked that up in the dictionary, and it means this. Appreciate is to correctly determine the value. To correctly determine the value. Now, we don't normally use this word but if in this connection, but really we talk about it as something appreciates in value. And we say houses appreciate in value. They go up in value over time. So it's determining the values when you appreciate something. Uh, art connoisseurs will go into a gallery and they'll look at paintings and they will appreciate the painting, taking into account all that they know, everything of the background, and they are experienced, and so they will appreciate an art piece, and put a value on it. You can go to a jeweler, you have a ring, you have a locket, you have something, and you want them to appraise it. Well, really what they're doing is appreciating it. And so they have tools to look at it, they have experience, they look at the quality of the stone, the color of the stone, and so forth. And they go through and appreciate it. Sometimes we don't know how to appreciate things. We might think something is very valuable and it's just fool's gold. It's not really gold. Or we make a look at something and say, that's really valuable. And yet it's really not a valuable because we don't appreciate it properly. And so if we are going to have genuine thanksgiving, it comes out of looking at whatever we're going to thank for, to say we need to appreciate it. We need to appreciate and see what's the true value of this happening, of this circumstance, of this opportunity, and we need to say what is the true value of this? And many times we don't know how to judge it. We, we might get it wrong. So if we want genuine thanksgiving, now we have to come and look at it and take it to someone that can give us a true evaluation of it. And that brings us to the next point. God is good, knowledgeable, and in control of everything. God is good, knowledgeable, and in control of everything. God is good. God is working 
for the greatest good of everyone. He's working for the greatest good of everyone. It may not be good necessarily for me right in this moment, but it's working for a greater good. You need to know God is good. That's his nature. And he's working so that the greatest good will come to the greatest number of people. And so just as a general might send soldiers to a task and it's ownersome, it may be painful, uh, they might suffer, they might lose sleep, they might have a thousand and one things, but in light of the battle, in light of the war, uh, they appreciate that this is necessary for the greater good. So I'm just trying to paint a picture here for us so we can get to what really is true thanksgiving. So God is good, but he's also knowledgeable. And maybe we can bring that slide up. He's also knowledgeable. He has omniscience. It means he's all-knowing. He knows everything that's allowed to be known uh, or is able to be known. God just knows everything. So he's good. He knows everything, and then he's in control of everything. It's not like he knows something, he'd like to see it happen, <sighs> can't do it. God is in control of everything. He's omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He's omnipresent. So he, everywhere, at the same time, knows everything, can do anything. He's in control. Do you know that God is in control of everything? We don't, we don't really see that. We, we don't realize that God is in control of everything. But the scripture says that he is. There's nothing that goes by him. Even Satan had to get permission from God in order to tempt Job because God is in control of everything. Now, everything that happens is not good. Everything that uh, happens is not originated by God, but he knows what's going to happen. He allows things to happen for a purpose and for a reason, because he has a greater good that he's going to bring out of it. So really, God is the only person that can truly evaluate and appreciate a situation. I have limited knowledge. I have limited perspective. God has all knowledge, all perspective. And so what I need to do is let God evaluate situations because he's in control. Now, when you really realize all these facts, you realize, really, I have nothing to complain about. Is God not good? Does God not know about this? Is he not in control? And so it's a matter of, of saying, you know what? I have nothing to complain about. And I put in your notes this statement. Any complaint is an affront to God. When you really think about it, if I complain about anything, I'm saying either, God, you're not good, you didn't know about this, or you're not able, or you're able to do this, but you're not doing it. And so I, what is there left to complain about if God is in control of everything? Now listen to the verse here in Philippians 2.13. It is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is working in us. He's working every situation to, for his will and his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. So right on the tail of that, he says, you should do all things without complaining and disputing and arguing about this and arguing with God and complaining to God and complaining to others. It says we should do how many things? All things without Complaining and disputing. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So it's a given that not everything is good. There are things you could complain about from a limited perspective because he's telling us we're living in a perverse generation. And, but we're to shine like bright lights. 
God's got a purpose in this. And the very fact that we give praise to God and we're not complaining and we're not arguing about everything that's happening is shining like a bright light. We're pointing towards something. People say, oh, how can you do that? Well, there's a light. We're a bright light. Where are we shining? We're shining towards God. We're to, whatever we do is to bring glory to the Lord. And so we're bright lights if we don't complain and we focus upon the Lord. So there should never be a thought, well, God missed it there. Or I know better. That should never have happened. Well, it may never, shouldn't have happened if it's perverse, but the thing is, God is in, bigger than this situation. And if he's allowed it to happen, like the temptation to Job, was it a good thing all of his houses were destroyed? All of his belongings, his livestock was, was destroyed? No. Invaders actually came in and did that. But the Lord was bigger than what was happening and so for us to say, you know, I know better. You know, what, what it really does, it makes us short-sighted. We don't see the big picture. We're just looking at this little area here. And because we can appreciate and have gratitude for this, we never thank God for it. And that short-sightedness robs us of the thanksgiving that God deserves and desires and that would benefit us to give. Folks, I'm talking to us this morning. <laughs> this message will change your life if you can embrace this. You, this really will change your life. It, it literally will change your worship, your praise, your thanksgiving. If we can see the spirit behind thanksgiving. So, here's your next point. We need to trust that all things are working together for good. I mean, this is the, the, the culmination of what we're saying here. Not all things are good. Some things are bad. But God is working them together for good because he has all knowledge. He's working for the good of everything. He's in control. So I can allow myself the sense I can't appreciate this but obviously God does because he could change it if he wanted to and he's not changing it at this point and this timing and so I have to allow him to be the judge I've taken my watch I've taken my uh, my efforts to the appraiser and I'm saying to the Lord, you know, you need to, and he's saying, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. I'm working this all for good. You're seeing this. I see this. And here it doesn't look good, but here it's going to be for good. You've got to trust me that I'm working it for good. Now, let's see if we can just test this out. What would be the worst thing that could ever happen in the history of mankind? What's the worst thing that could ever happen? Well, I think we'd have to all be agreed. It's when Jesus was taken, the Son of God, no sin, spotless, and was crucified on the cross. That has to be the greatest wrong, the greatest tragedy that could ever happen. And if you looked at that day, and they did, the disciples were devastated. I mean, they were down. They were weeping. The, lady, the women were weeping. Now, Jesus told them, don't weep. But they were weeping. They just saw what was happening. And it was over, overwhelming. What should we do? We need to do what Jesus did. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here's Jesus suffering all of this, going through it. He himself 
in a sense, is struggling with this because in the garden he's praying, you know, let this pass from me. I don't like this. This is not going to be good. I'm not looking forward to doing. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, he's going to rely upon God who's good and knows everything and is in control. And he says, but not by my will, but thy will be done. And so he endures the pain of the cross. He despises the shame. Despise means to look down on as worthless. It's beneath me. It's not even worth my consideration. I just despise that. He despises the shame hanging naked on the cross, physically naked, emotionally spent, and spiritually taking the sins of the world upon himself. I mean, this has got to be the lowest point of all point until he actually dies. He actually cries out sort of, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's sensing he has to endure something that's not very pleasant. I mean, to put it mildly. He is going through a terrible time, but this scripture says, you know what? He did it looking for the joy that was set before him. And he was able to go through the pain He despised the shame, and he is actually sitting now at the right hand of the Father. Amazing. Amazing. Is it only for Jesus to do this? Can we do this? I mean, is it possible for us to do it? Well, all you have to do is read it on in the chapter. Just go down two or three verses later. I mean, he's in the same concept of talking about this. And in verse 6, he says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So he's saying, you know what? We're going to go through hard times. It might be because of the consequence of our actions, or it might be the consequence of someone else's actions. You're going to go through this. We're living in a perverse generation. It also says offenses are going to come. We're going to suffer these things. So when we're suffering it, it says we need to realize and, and that the Lord is in this. Now listen to what it goes on to say. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the moment. It's not joyful in that moment for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So again, He's drawing the analogy. If Jesus did this on the cross, how much more should we, the difficult times we're going through, realize there's a bigger plan in this, there's a bigger purpose in all of this. I may not see it, but it's there. Now listen to what it says in James 1, verses 2 to 4. Count it all joy. That's everyone say joy. Joy. We don't associate joy with what he's going to go on to say. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God is doing something. He's filling you in. He's making you perfect. He's bringing something about that you don't know, and you should count it as joy. There should be a joyful attitude. You have to say, you know what? I really appreciate this. And why can you appreciate it? Not because you see it, because God says it. And you have to do it by faith. Because you've got to have faith that God is working. You have to have faith that God's working it together for good. If you go by your own perspective, you will not have joy. You will frown. You will complain. You will get down under this thing. You'll be discouraged. It will, all, it will try to, to wipe you up. Remember what we said, you know, we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not supposed to be crushed. But if you just have your own perspective, you will feel crushed. When you have despair, or what, you know, it says we're perplexed, but not to despair, because we have a bigger perspective. And it's only by faith. And now you have to be patient. Testing of your faith produces patience. It's not going to just change in a moment. You can't understand it in a moment. You, you might go for a long time not understanding it, having to have faith. 
I got to believe God's in this because he's good and he knows everything. He's in charge of everything. So I don't understand it. So I, by faith, I'm working with patience and this will let it work out. It's going to bring something perfect. Just see how these verses that we can read over and we know them sort of in our head, but they've never dropped to our heart. Because in our heart, we're complaining. In our heart, we're discouraged. We're not praising God. We've allowed Satan to set the perspective. We've listened to his voice, and he's framed it in a certain way that will discourage you. Unless you break out of it, and you say, wait a minute, I shouldn't be complaining about anything because God is good, and he's working all things together for good, even the bad things he's working for good. And so that faith in God, and I'm going to be patient through this time because he's working some perfect thing out of this. This has got to not just be in our head, it's got to drop to our hearts. Now, here's your next Point. The spirit behind thanksgiving elicits an active expression of thanks to God and others. So this has got to go beyond a sort of an understanding. Oh boy, this is really, really, really bad. Really bad. Really bad. Uh, oh, this is this is terrible, terrible. But God, you know what? God's God, God's got to be doing something in this. He wants it to go beyond sort of a head knowledge, but in your emotions and in your spirit, you are still inwardly. No, if you really get the spirit of thanksgiving, when you really understand what is behind thanksgiving that energizes it, that makes it so powerful, that releases God into a situation, then you need to give active expression of thanks to God and others. Thanksgiving Giving, it's giving of thanks. Worship is expression. It's not just the feeling, it's expressing it. It's singing, it's clapping, it's raising hands, it's bowing down. There's physical expressions that should come out of the spirit of thanksgiving that allows you to do what the next verse says. And it's our key verse for this message. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How many things do you give thanks for? Everything. Everything. Good things, bad things, trials, tribulations, hurts, offenses. You give thanks. Thanks doesn't mean just know that God's working. No, it, it, there's an active thing here. This is thanksgiving. You give thanks. Now, why do you do this? Because you know Christ is in this. And this is his will for you. Well, I don't know why it all happens to me. Look at this person over there. They're not, they're not having to go through this. It seems everything's going well. Why, why is this always happening to me? Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I don't understand it. I don't know why. God is good. God knows everything. He's working something here beyond my knowledge. And all I know, this is the lot he's given me. This is what I have to handle as I go through life. Because this is what he's given me. So there's no sense me complaining about it, going through this, if only, if only, if only that hadn't happened. If only, if only something else. And we blame others and Satan loves. He twists us around and around. He plays in our mind. He steals our joy. He steals our thanksgiving. We become complainers and whiners. We should be praisers. We need to shine like a bright light. We're in a, in a dark situation, but we're shining like a bright light in this situation because God's in control. And I don't know what he's working out, but I know he's working something good. 
It's got to be good because God's in it. This is what energizes our worship. It energizes our praise. Now listen. The story in Genesis 50. I don't want to take a long time here, but it illustrates it so beautiful. The life of Joseph. He's given these dreams from God. He is he believes God's got a plan and purpose for his life, but his brothers get jealous of him. They are older. They sell him as a slave to Egypt. They feel he's done with, he's gone. They don't know. He goes to Egypt. He's sold on the block to Potiphar, and he served, becomes a servant in Potiphar's house. But you know what? He's got a heart that's towards God. And he starts serving Potiphar and he rises through the household. Then Potiphar's wife looks at him and she tries to seduce him. But he has integrity. He's going to follow God. And he's putting God first. And he knows, I don't know. It doesn't say that he worships, but he had to be because of all the actions that he did. He just sort of sloughs it off and he keeps worshiping God. And she lies about him says he tried to rape her, and so he's arrested, he's put in the dungeon. You can go on and on in this story. Everything that Joseph saw was bad. It's not good. This does not line up with what the dreams I feel God has given me. But he doesn't lose his faith. He maintains his integrity, and he doesn't succumb to Potiphar's wife's seduction. He puts God's first. And you can go through the whole story, and I won't, but he eventually comes out the other side. And now he's the second in command in Egypt. And there's a famine. And his, fam his brothers come down to buy grain. They don't know Joseph. He's now in the, you know, the Egyptian garb. And, uh, but you can read the story. He eventually reveals himself to his brothers. The whole family is moved to Egypt. They have special treatment because of Joseph. And, but then Jacob, Joseph's father, dies. And we pick up the story here in Genesis 50 and verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us. May he actually repay us for all the, listen, the evil which we did to him. It was evil, folks. This was not, you know, they just should have done better. No, this was evil, evil intent. And they said, he's surely going to repay us now for this. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? It's like Joseph saying, you know what? I'm not God. I can't see all this. It was like every step of the way, he, in his mind, said, hey, I'm not in the place of God. I'm sold like a slave. I'm in Potiphar's house. I'm lied about. I'm now in the dungeon. I'm not in the place of God. God's the only one that can understand this. He said, I'm not in the place of God, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Joseph had this perspective. You know what? You're meaning it for evil, but God's bigger in this situation, and he means it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive, he saw it begin to unfold. Oh, this is why that happened. Oh, that's why this happened. He could see it now. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So now his acts of thanksgiving, he wasn't embittered by what happened. He was able to freely forgive his brothers because he had thanksgiving for what had happened. He had a bigger perspective. Am I helping you this morning? This will change your life. This will transform you. 
These things alone, this spirit behind thanksgiving will transform your life. This could be a thanksgiving weekend that you're completely different after. But you have to open your heart to receive this now this morning. Now, if, if it's not just Old Testament. Peter, not Peter, Paul goes to this place to preach. He casts this demon out of a girl. The people that were making money off the girl get all upset. They get the magistrates and they arrest Paul. They bring him and the magistrates uh, beat him, have him beaten, and then they're thrust into the jail, into the inner prison, into the dungeon. Now, can we put ourselves in this, this? We're Christians. We've gone to preach the gospel. All this happens to us. What would you be doing that night at midnight? I'm, I'm trying to put myself there. I think under the best of circumstances, I'd be talking to myself. God, you gotta have, you got to be doing something good out of this. I, I don't understand it. But I wouldn't have been too happy. What did they do? Here's what they did at midnight. Let me read it to you in Acts 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. In this situation, they had an active expression of thanksgiving. I don't know. Maybe there's some. I don't know anyone. Would we be doing that? I mean, if it was you and me in the prison, would we be doing this? I, I would like to think I'd be processing it. But I don't think it would get to a place where I was actually singing out loud, so loud it woke up all the other prisoners. And we're singing and praising God. Somehow they had the spirit behind thanksgiving. They could give thanks in everything. Because this was the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning them. And the earthquake happened. And the prison doors came open. The jailer, he's afraid that they've all escaped and now he's going to be punished for it. He, he thinks, oh, maybe I might as well just take my own life. They say, stop, stop, stop. Don't, don't take your own life. We haven't finished the song yet. It's okay. We're, we're singing. We're worshiping God here. And it moves this man so much. They were a bright light. Really. Shone like a bright light. And the, and the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul told him the gospel and went out and baptized him that night. Now, this is not theory. Our problem is we, I'm wondering whether we really touch true thanksgiving if we're only thanking God for the good things we think are good. And how shallow that must be to the Lord. Thank the Lord for giving me that job. Thank the Lord I found that pair of shoes. Thank the Lord for this and that and the good things in my life. I wonder if the Lord even sees that as thanks. I'm sure he does, and we should. But I, I, I think unless it gets that we're giving thanks in all things, that our thanksgiving isn't limited to what our perspective is of what we appreciate that brings gratefulness to us that we can then say thank you, God, for. I'm afraid that we are saying thankful things to the Lord with our mouth and we have never engaged our heart. We sing songs of thanksgiving, but it's not any deeper than the melody. It, because it can be disrupted so easily. 
And we get to a place where we, we might say, well, thank you, Lord, and even say it. But inside, you're still holding the self-pity of what was done towards you that was wrong. And you're still holding the sorrow of a situation. You're still angry with someone who has said something. You're still disappointed. You're still sad over something. There's still a resentment. And you really feel justified in holding that because you see how evil it was. And Satan has robbed your joy, taken away your witness, and brought you a place of depression because you're only seeing it from your eyes and you're not, there's really not a perspective that God's working all things together for good. It's a verse we can quote, but it doesn't go deep enough to change the emotions within us that's crippling us. And I'm saying, oh God, let us break out of this today. Lord, let, let's, stop, let's start singing hymns. Let's start praising God. Let's start verbalizing something that's different. My feeling is like I just want to be down, but no, I'm going to raise my hands and I'm going to express and I'm going to think about the goodness of, of God and all he's done for me. And I'm going to think about his plan. And I'm going to think about Joseph. And I'm going to think about Jesus on the cross. And I'm going to think about Paul and Silas in the jail. And I'm going to think about this and say, if they can worship, if they can praise, then mouth, you're going to open, you're going to express. And it's coming out of a heart that's united. It's coming out of a spirit behind the words of thanksgiving that's energizing that worship, that's penetrating the darkness, that causes prisons to shake and breaks the bondage of what Satan wants to do because we're seeing what God wants to do. So we're praying positive prayers of thanksgiving to God, just expectant of what he's going to do. And all the negative emotions are melting away because we're standing in the presence of God worshiping. I said, oh God, let this be for me. Let it be for our congregation. Let it be for our families. Let it be for our, our church. That we're catching a spirit of thanksgiving that's much broader than just the little limited perspective that I have. So here's the last point I just say to you. Act out of genuine thankfulness. I mean, you have to say to yourself, okay, if I am genuinely thankful, how would I act? More than the expression to the Lord. See, we can say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. But how would we treat the people around us if we were truly thankful? Well, Jesus points to this in Matthew Chapter 5 and verse 44, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. These are verses that we think, I can never do this. But it says, but this will be the natural consequence if we truly are thankful and we have a bigger perspective, and we have faith in God, then I really can love my enemies, because he's working something here. I can bless the ones that are cursing me and do good to those who hate me, and I can pray for those who, they're using me, and they're spitefully using me. But I'm praying for them, because that's the outgrowth of thanksgiving to God. This shouldn't be something that's hard to do, this should be something that naturally happens if we have a true spirit of thanksgiving. And these things just naturally, and we're shining like a bright light. No one can understand this. You're shining like a bright light because of this. When I was thinking about this, I thought of this book here. Some of you will recognize it. Prison to Praise. Prison to Praise. Written in 1970. I read this book when it first came out, 50 years ago. 
It was an exciting book to read. It was written by Merlin Carruthers, a chaplain in the U.S. Army. And he began to see these things that I'm just sharing now. It basically was two verses he put together. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, and God works all things together for good. So he put those two verses together, and it was like a revelation to him. And so he began to use it as a chaplain. And when people would come to him for counsel and be sharing all their woes and despair and, and be so down, when they talked to him, he'd say, you can read it in the book, he'd say, it's okay, I have the answer for you. And he said they sort of looked, yeah, yeah, you will never have to worry about that again. That, that depression, that hurt and all that. And they said, what? And he said, let's get down right now and thank God for that situation. And he goes and tells in the book how no one wants to do it. Because, no, no, that's evil. I can't thank God for that. that that's, that's bad. I, I, that's, the, that's my problem. How can I thank God for it? And then he'd go over all the verses and say to him, listen, you need to thank God. Because if you thank God, you're going to release God's power into that situation. You're agreeing by faith that God's working something out of this. And now you are aligning yourself. See, it says all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It works together for good if you align yourself with God. Lord, you, I have to believe you have, you're, you're in this, so I'm in it. If you're in it, I'm in it. I love you, Lord, and I want your will done. I'm in agreement with your will to happen out of this. When you do that, you release a power into the situation. You become a vessel that God can use to actually rectify the situation. But you have to give yourself to it. So I was, when I was doing this message, I looked on the shelf and I, I picked out this book and I just started leafing through it. And I came across the story. And I'll just share, share the story that he relates in the book. He said when he started to do this, that this lady came to him. And this lady was suicidal. And, uh, and, and just so many pains and physical things was happening to her because of her depression and everything. And so she came in and, and started talking to him. And she slowly told the story. Her husband had an affair. And there was a child that was born from a woman that he wasn't married to. And she was young. She wasn't able to keep the child, but he felt responsibility. And so um, he was supporting the child. And the child was actually being raised by her in-laws, her husband's parents. She was, every time she went to visit the in-laws, the child was there. And not only that, many times the woman was there because she was the mother of the baby. And it was just tearing her apart. It was just, she couldn't get past it. She was, she was resentful towards her husband, unforgiving towards him. Every time she saw the child, she would just, just think how terrible a situation this would be. It just took her to a state where she said, I can't bear it any longer. So she goes to Merlin Carruthers, and he says, it's OK, I got the answer. And she says, what? And she, he said, we need to get down right now and thank God that your husband fathered this child. She said, I can't do that. that. That was wrong. And he went through, again, all the verses and all the scriptures, saying to, you know, in this, give thanks. Not that that was a good thing, but God's going to work this for good. And you can give thanks in this thing. And you need to thank God. And if you thank God, it's going to change that pain in your heart. Anyway, she gets down. And she prays, and she wrestles through this, and she thanks God that this baby was fathered by her husband and was brought into the world. Well, she leaves the office, and he calls her the next day, and he says, how are you doing? She says, I feel fantastic. And he said, what do you mean? What happened? She said, well, when I got home, and I was thinking about if I was truly thankful for this child, what would I do? See, she was going to act on acts of thanksgiving out of her appreciation. And she said, I thought to myself, 
Well, they're always struggling. The baby never has enough. Or the husband's trying to help, but they, they, money was short. So she decides she'd go and she would buy stuff for the, for the child. And then she opened the checkbook and she wrote a check to the lady to, for her to help so that she could raise this baby. And when she did this, she said, I just felt joy. Joy just started to come out. And I began to realize, okay, I, I can't control this, but God's in control. And she just started to sow into this situation. So a few days later, he called her again and said, how are you doing? She said, I still feel great. She said, I even feel better. And he said, well, what happened? She said, well, when that lifted off me, she said, I became aware, I knew it, but never really affected her, that she had a neighbor that had a mentally challenged child. And she said, I start to think, you know what? That mother is having a hard time raising that child. I wonder what I can do to help. She went over. She talked to her neighbor and said, how can I do to help you? This mother was so relieved. And, and she said, oh, that would be so fantastic. And so uh, Merlin Crothers said to the lady, well, well, did you know how to help? And that? She said, oh, yeah. She said, actually, I studied for that. But she, and he said, did you ever use it? He said, no, I never used it. But she said, now I'm finding all the things I was trained, and I'm feeling joy. I'm helping my neighbor, and I'm helping the child, and I feel good about the, my husband, and, and my relationship with my husband is being restored. See, it all comes out of a spirit of thanksgiving, breaking the lies of Satan. But what we don't see, folks, I really, I, this, you know, this is the bottom line to me in this message. I don't think we go far enough. We go to the point of realization in my mind, yeah, God's got to be working stuff together for good. You know, I, I, yeah, I, but I'm still holding the pain. I still have the sorrow. But we, we, we say, well, you know, but God must be working something out of this. As if you'd think. <laughs> but we still are giving the devil the credit for it. You know, we even make statements. Well, you... You got the devil to thank for that. As if his will is going about, thanking the devil for things. But I think if we really caught hold of thanksgiving, of expressing thanksgiving that's coming from a spirit of thanksgiving that understands God is in control of everything, he's working everything for good, if I really laid hold of it and then begin to act on that, just like this lady did. If I really was thankful, what would I do? Well, I'd help the baby. If, if I really believed that, then maybe I could pray for someone who's spitefully using me. And, and now we become a force for good, releasing God's power into situations that before we just sort of acquiesce passively of, uh, yeah, I guess God's in control but we act as if he's not. And we're wishing in everything that the prison doors would open where we can run out. Rather than realize, you know what? God's bigger than that. And I just need to be faithful and give God thanks. I don't know what tomorrow will hold, but I know this. I can give thanks in it because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning me. Would this transform our lives? I'm talking to myself. Would this transform my life? Have I really laid hold of this? I believe it will. Would you stand with me this morning? Amen. Oh, you've, been, you've been patient this morning, but I hope there's been something downloaded to your spirit. That this would not just be truths that goes into your mind. But may there be a spiritual reality that enters into our hearts. I wonder if you'd let me pray for you this morning. Would you take your hands, just however you would do it, and uh, on, your, on your heart, and just sort of open your hands like you're opening your heart, just so like I'm opening my heart, Lord, and just opening my heart now. Because your heart has to be open to this. See, your heart, <laughs> it's been calloused by the hurts that you've suffered. And to protect yourself, you have put barriers around your heart. 
And you need to open your heart this morning to this truth because it will transform you. And, and just say, God, I, I, I'm letting all the barriers down. I, I'm not going to be resistant to this word. I, I, I want to hear this this morning and enter my heart. Lord, I pray right now that you, this word would find a lodging place in our heart. This truth, this spirit, this spirit of thanksgiving. May it grip us. May, may it transform us. May it change our attitudes and our feelings and our actions, Lord, this morning. Would we just come to you and say, God, would you just do something here that would be beyond us, beyond our ability? May this be a red letter day this Thanksgiving day that it would not just be a day that we say words but we'd be transformed by the spirit of thanksgiving oh God may it be in my life and my family in this church and everyone that's standing here this day I pray in Jesus name and can you just say let it be let it be just say it again let it be you know what amen means let it be and you're just basically saying, let it be. Let it be. Let it happen in me. So let's just say it a couple times more. Let it be. Let it be. Let it happen in us, O oh Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, it's been good this morning.